Barbados for the Caribbean. Um, as you know, the focus today will be on violence against women and children um, before we go into our section on ongoing coordination on MHPSS and COVID-19. So we're going to start um, with a presentation by our uh, violence and injury prevention advisor, Britta Beyer, um, who will um, give us some um, key messages around uh, violence against women and their children in the context of COVID-19. She will also share with us some of the available tools and resources. And then for our section on coordination on MHPSS and COVID-19, um, Dr. Cayetano will present to us the plan of action that PAHO has developed on MHPSS and COVID-19. And then I will share with you some thoughts and ideas for a calendar of our ongoing um, webinars. Um, and then at the end, we'll open uh, a forum for questions and answers and exchanges on things that are happening at country level, needs, etc. So before we start, uh, because it's not a lot of us connected, we have 20 participants, we thought maybe we would start with a quick round of introductions. So if you want to um, go ahead, maybe I can call um, your names, you can just mute yourself your name, your country, um, and what is your position, uh, very brief. Um, so we make it a little bit more personal and we get to know each other. So Amy, if you want to start. Um, maybe good morning. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. Uh, good morning, I'm Deetra Bethel. I'm in Nassau, Bahamas. I am. Um, I guess I employed at the University of the Bahamas as a, a counselor. And of course, I do some private work as well. Thank you. I'm, uh, I'm Barrington Brennan. Did you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. I'm Barrington Brennan from the Bahamas, member of the Bahamas Psychological Association, and uh, a private practice in marriage and family counseling services in Nassau and special interest in training in domestic violence, intimate partner abuse, and so forth. Thanks. Hello, good morning. My name is Gail Thomas, and I am the communications focal point here at PAHO in Trinidad and Tobago. Good morning. Good morning. Iris Strawn from the Ministry of Education in Nassau, Bahamas, and I am the Employee Assistance Program Coordinator. My name is Aubrey Mendonza. I'm the IT consultant at PAHO in Trinidad and Tobago office. Over. Good morning. I'm Wendy Fernander. I am the mental health and psychosocial coordinator, um, point person for the Bahamas. And the president of Bahamas Psychological Association. Hi, good morning. I'm Wendy uh, Emanuelson, working at the PAHO in Suriname as the natural consultant for NCD and mental health. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Caroline Allen. I'm the program manager for Spotlight Initiative. Just started in Trinidad and Tobago, the national project for Spotlight. Hi, I'm Jennifer Joseph, Community Mental Health Officer in Montserrat. Morning, I'm June Hutchison. I'm the Coordinator of Counselors for the Catholic Board of Education, Nassau, Bahamas, and good morning, everyone. Good morning, my name is Virginia Rubin. I am the Director of Mental Health Services in the Virgin Islands, and I'm a clinical psychologist by training. So, I think. 
So is there anyone who hasn't introduced themselves? Feel, please feel free to unmute um, your mic and let us know your name, um, your position and your company. Good morning, can you hear me? Yes, Karen, go ahead. Good morning, I'm Karen Roberts. I'm the specialist for NCDs and mental health in the Pahu Guyana country office. Good morning. Good morning. Michelle Harris from Jamaica. Just to say I'm wrapping up another meeting, then I will join you fully. Thanks for joining, Michelle. So, has everybody um, introduced themselves? I can go. Hi, good morning. My name is Claudina Cayetano. I'm the advisor for uh, mental health and I'm stationed in with PAHO and I'm stationed in uh, Washington. We have Deepna with us too. We have Deepna. I don't know if she. Deepna, we have Amy and Brita. Good morning, everybody. This is Britta, and um, I'm the advisor on violence prevention, also here in DC, to connect with everybody. Okay. So, um, I think we can go ahead. Oh, I'll, yeah, we, can, we can start. Um, myself are trying to solve in the background a little technical issue. We're trying to um, have her share her screen. Britta, I have not received your presentation over email, so I don't know if, if you want to maybe try sharing your screen again. Oh, here it is. Sorry, I have no idea what my computer is. Don't worry, don't worry. I don't know it. Um, so let me. To the presenter. Um, colleagues, bear with me. It's a joy of technology. Downloading the presentation. Um, which I don't know if in. Um, if you want to, um, a little bit of an um, overview of what you're going to be covering while I manage to get the, the slides on the screen. Here it is. Sure. Yeah, sure. Um, and, and, and thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, I think it's, um, uh, it's great that there uh, is interest in this topic, uh, particularly in this context. Of course, uh, from my perspective uh, and 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 Paula Bijo, this is uh, an important topic to look at. So it's very timely that we have this discussion now. And um, I know we had some previous discussion in this network about violence and, and violence, mental health, and emergencies. So I think it's really good that we continue this discussion um, because a lot. And um, I will focus more in the in on where we are in the current context, but I think a lot of these um, things that we know about violence in emergencies are very applicable in general. Um, so um, I thought it would be interesting for me to start just about quickly saying why it matters. Um, and it matters because we know that globally about one in three women um, experience lifetime physical and sexual violence, and that matches about the re rate in uh, the region of the Americas. We also know that about 58% of children in Latin America and the Caribbean uh, experience violence. So this is a pretty high burden um, that we already have in the region that we need to address. And there's no reason to assume that um, it does not continue to happen. Um, so it is something that um, we need to continue paying attention to. Um, 
The interesting thing, particularly in the context of violence against women, is that we also know from the data we have that the most common form of violence against women is intimate partner violence. That means it is violence. They're most at risk of violence by somebody they know. That might be somebody who's a husband, a boyfriend, a partner, or somebody that, um, that is a family member who lives in their household. And I'll get back to that uh, in a bit. And the second reason why it matters is that we also know that violence increases or is very likely to increase during any kind of emergency, particularly uh, including epidemics. Can we go to the next slide? Um, so um, not only um, do we need to continue paying attention to this topic, but it is likely the demand for services for support for attention to this topic is likely to increase. And in the case of COVID-19, we know that um, isolation or distancing measures um, may have a particularly acute impact on women and their children in the context of violence. So uh, remember what I said just now about uh, intimate partner violence um, or somebody they know being the most likely perpetrator. Well, as, as a sort of a result of distancing or lockdown procedures we see in some contexts now, the time spent inside or the time spent um, within in close contact with some of these family members might increase, thus increasing the risk. Um, we also know that COVID-19 may increase stress, anxiety, economic worries, which again is associated with um, a high risk of violence. We you know that women, for example, bear a brunt of a lot of the um, household work, the care function, um, that might be exacerbated due to school closures, again, increasing the stress. Um, at the same time that risk factors increase, we also know that protective factors decrease. So things that protect women and, and children from violence will be less, um, will be less, uh, will be less accessible. That includes um, simply restrictions on movement to get more information, to get help, to um, get support. It might include contact with family members or friends that can provide social support in situations of violence. It may include school closures that provide less access to, to um, school and other types of protective services for children. Um, it might include uh, limited or less easy access to health and other types of social services that can help to identify and provide onward support. And it includes, of course, um, the concerns around economic independence, economic livelihoods that might be at risk. So given all of this, it's really important that there is attention to violence against women and their children in the context of COVID-19 response. And although it's really important, you go to the next slide, it's really important to, to acknowledge that, that we are in a situation where, of course, a lot of resources are stretched. At the same time, there are things that can be done um, to mitigate the impact of violence on women and children. And this is not an area where we're clueless. <laughs> and the very first step, I think, is important is that there is awareness of the connections between the risk of violence, particularly against women and children, and the current um, um, pandemic. Um, that, is, that is sort of the first step which is why um, in the context of like sort of government or policymakers, it's really important that concerns around violence are integrated into different steps of the health emergency preparedness and planning process. Um, that there is investment in essential services or essential programs in that context and uh, that the work on it continues. Um, there, as a sort of health system facility level, um, one of the first key steps would be around mapping existing service delivery modalities and referral pathways, because it is very likely that these pathways and modalities will be affected by the COVID-19 response. So, for example, it will no longer be as easy to find out where there are support mechanisms, whether these are still open, whether opening hours have changed, whether contact details have changed, whether now the the contact for a survivor might be through the phone or through internet instead of face-to-face. -face. These are all new or updates to a referral pathway that 
that in a first step would be good to map to then be able to identify gaps and find solutions to it. Um, if you go to the next slide, um, one key thing on what, what we can do is that um, like before <laughs> or on violence in general, I think the message very much that there is not just one actor on, or um, one sector that should be responding to violence in the context of COVID-19, but it does require, once again, the collaboration across sectors and across stakeholders, including thinking through whether if there is, for example, a lot of stress on health services or certain health services at the moment, are there tasks that can be sort of shifted? to another actor, uh, even if it's just a temporary measure to make sure the, the needs of survivors of violence are still met. And if you go to the next slide, please. Can you? Um, there are a lot of examples um, of action um, that we do see in many countries. Um, this is, of course, very, very early days in some ways. So we do not yet have a comprehensive overview of what works. Um, but Tahoe um, WHO, as well as many other partners um, that we work with, are currently sort of collecting examples, collecting experiences. They're very interested to hear from um, people working in countries and different modalities. What are things that they're thinking about? What are ideas that could be trialed, that could be um, um, documented? Because I think that is a really important aspect of the work that we all do. We keep learning from each other and keep documenting, keep uh, getting better uh, as part of it. Um, so one um, aspect that, that, uh, that has been repeatedly stressed is simply framing uh, violence against women and children's services as essential services that must continue during the COVID-19 response. And, uh, that needs to be made very clear often at, at sort of a high level. Um, to make sure that these services are not seen as, as additional or, um, um, or uh, that they continue to be prioritized. Um, secondly, um, it's about thinking through where there are opportunities for online service delivery, including using mHealth and telehealth. Um, there, the use of hotlines, particularly phone lines, is something that is, has um, long been used in the context of violence, particularly in resource constrained settings. But increasingly, we're also looking at sort of newer, more innovative ways through, um, uh, through telehealth, through internet-based um, support, through um, using of like apps and chat groups, both in terms of service delivery um, of the, for example, health system, but also to provide types of social support or like self-help mechanisms uh, or access to information for survivors. So I think there's a lot there that we can still strengthen, try, share with each other. Um, the third area around where we see some examples is that there are some countries who have now established sort of new types of emergency alert systems. For example, because the old one, the old mechanisms in some contexts that might exist about identifying um, survivors um, of violence might not function anymore or might no longer be the best way to capture cases of violence. So we're looking at where that is the case, what are things that you can do, for example, working through pharmacies, working through supermarkets, about still continuing to be able to identify uh, survivors of violence that provide support. A fourth area that we see now in some countries is about addressing some of the risk factors of violence, um, including potentially the harmful use of alcohol, or access to arms that can help to reduce um, the risk of violence. Um, and lastly, I think it's really important to keep strengthening information in this area, as I've already said, including about approaches that are being trialed, uh, but also to engage communities themselves. And I, I will get back to that point in a bit later. But it's really important that we're sort of that this is an area where we continue to share information, um, not just with the sort of standard across sectors networks that you have already, but also engaging through social media, through new ways of community engagement, communities themselves about this topic. Um, there are a couple of um, sort of messages that we've developed uh, for different target groups. And I'm just going to give you a quick highlight of some of them, um, because it's a bit difficult to, to go into each of them in more detail. But uh, there are, of course, messages around for health, particularly healthcare providers. Uh, first, 
to again be aware or have a basic knowledge about the links between risk consequence of violence in the context of COVID um, and how to identify women and children um, subject to violence. Uh, remember that um, we in violence do not recommend um, universal screening. That means asking every person that we see in a healthcare setting about their experience of violence, but violence should be in a, in a, in a healthcare setting around uh, based on clinical assessment and certain characteristics or where we suspect violence. Um, it is also about yet again stressing the, the urgency or the need for first line support, um, which um, is um, sort of informed by psychological first aid, but it includes things like um, listening, uh, being patient, calm, don't pressure, don't assume that you know what the survivor is going through, um, inquiring through open ended questions rather than providing um, advice. Um, um, or asking why certain things are happening, why certain things are being felt, validating the experience of the survivor. I think that is a really important one because in the context of violence, one key thing that we keep struggling with is the, the social acceptability um, of violence in some situations. So it's really important where when as part of the first response, it is made clear that that violence is not acceptable, that the survivor is not to claim uh, and that their life, their health and their well-being is valuable. Um, it's also about enhancing the safety of the survivor. And that means often just talking them through um, concerns around safety and options for safety planning. That might be other family members or friends they can rely on. It might be thinking through um, how um, their movement would be um, affected um, in the context of distancing and quarantine measures that might exist, where they would be still be able and how they would be able to get additional information, additional support. And it's also lastly about providing them with that additional support, including referrals to other services. And those referrals might be other medical interventions that are necessary. Um, for example, in the context of sexual violence, there is a timeliness factor that we need to keep in account. This is an example of services that, that can't wait, where we have a time frame that needs to be met. Um, it is also about additional mental health assessment and care that might be needed. Um, we know violence can be a stressor, and this is currently happening in a context that might already be stressful for various other factors, including in the context of COVID. Um, so we're sort of suggesting around, on the one hand, basic psychological support, um, including providing information about sort of normal stress reactions in the context of violence, um, as well as identifying uh, uh, issues and providing support, helping the survivor manage this, um, including through, for example, positive coping methods. Um, but it's also about thinking through what follow-up might look like, including follow-up and monitoring um, of the survivor's uh, mental as well as physical health in the context of COVID. Um, so how would we be able to connect with them again if we need to? What are some of the things that we need to think through? Um, and for, if I just move on to the message of survivors, there are some key messages that we want survivors to have that, um, that on the one hand include around being aware of the risk to it, but then also give some potentially some tips and they would need to be adjusted, of course, to the given context, providing some practical tips and that can be through, um, both through interactions with survivors, sort of one-on-one -on -one action, but it can also be through other types of communication channels, making sure that survivors have access to necessary information and tips around how to deal with violence in the context of COVID-19. And, and you will see when you read some of these, I'm not going through each of the details, but they are very similar to some of the things that um, I think Claudina presented last time around how what are some of the things around daily routine, seeking support from family or friends, relaxation, exercise, stress management that can be considered to help. Um, it also includes, again, or puts emphasis on this idea of a safety plan um, 
Because we know that access to protection services, particularly former protection services, might be more difficult. So it is worth think, having that space to think through how this might look, how safety might look in this new reality, in case the violence gets worse. There are also some messages I mentioned earlier that we want to send to communities. Because of the situation, because of the increased risk of violence, we really need community engagement, community mobilization on this topic. And that starts with ensuring that there's awareness in the community about the increased risk of violence in the context um, of this. But at the same time, making very clear that violence is never justified. Um, and it's also about encouraging community members to reach out, keep in touch, support women and the children at, that might be at risk of violence, particularly at the community level. And um, the aspect of social support uh, is really important uh, in the context of violence. Uh, so it's worth putting particular emphasis on it. But it's also about making sure that people are at least um, a little bit aware of some of the risks about reaching out, including making sure that it's safe to connect with survivors. So it shouldn't be on a public messaging board, for example. Um, but and also being, being up to date or encouraging everybody in the community to be up to date on where we can get more information, where we can get more support, to be able to help spread information uh, about um, where, where there is support. And, I do want to stress, I know the time is tight, but I do want to stress a little bit around um, violence against children. We know that children are one of the sort of vulnerable groups that is um, at risk of violence in the context um, of COVID-19. Um, and it's sort of twofold. On the one hand, it might be, they might be at risk of experiencing violence directly, but there's a second related risk that is to witnessing violence that might happen in the family. There are two things we need to keep in account because violent, family violence, including violence against women, intimate partner violence, intersects with other types of violence children. So we want to address both the witnessing of violence as well as the, the direct experience of violence, such as child maltreatment, for example. And of course, like, like I have just mentioned, all of this is exacerbated by uh, things such as distancing and lockdown measures, school closures are a particular challenge because that is, has been a system that has helped us in the past provide support to address risk factors related to violence, but also to help have an opportunity to identify um, potential vulnerable groups. Um, now, um, there's a key question around how do we keep ensuring access to some of the support, some of these protection mechanisms, and how can some of these be like reframed? Maybe some can be provided through online telehealth and health provide, but like how can we keep making sure that there's access um, to support and protection? And some of the responses we've seen again are very similar around integrating violence against children into planning around health emergency preparedness and response, making very clear that there are some core essential services related to violence against children that should be continued. Um, and there might be the need, um, depending on a mapping of, that, of these services, for new innovative ways of emergency alert mechanisms. But lastly, it's also about making sure that we engage and support parents and caregivers. Um, and this slide is one example of that um, as part of WHO's Healthy at Home campaign, which addresses a number of thing, issues. Um, there are also one of the four pillars is around messaging and resources for parents, including some six tips or six fact sheets around um, how, how to manage, how to provide support around healthy parenting. And I personally find them very useful and um, um, and I encourage everybody to have a look at them. Um, there are some additional resources as well that, that address um, other parts of it. Um, and then lastly, um, I'm going to stop here, I'm sure I'm over time, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but I'd be very interested to hear uh, any feedback and resources. This is an area that that is changing rapidly, but it's also an area where we, where we do have the evidence to act now. I do want to stress that we have a lot of resources. Some of these resources are on violence in general, 
um, not specific to COVID-19. Some of these are now statements and declarations of issues that come out specifically adapted to COVID-19. I think to me, the important thing is that there is a lot of information guides and resources out there on this topic. And it that, yes, while there's currently ongoing and sort of ongoing rise of new things are coming out, new information that's being collected. Um, there are, there's a lot that we have now that, that allows us to act now on this topic. Um, and um, I'd be happy to, these are just some snapshots of resources. I'm happy to ask, to answer any questions also, or connect you to other specific resource needs. Um, we are, as I said, at the moment, sort of collecting experiences from countries, from partners. Uh, and we'll continue to do this and very open to hear any suggestions about how we can strengthen this area of work together. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, Brita, for that uh, very good comprehensive presentation. Um, and I would now like to open the floor to the colleagues who are connected for any comments, questions, uh, please feel free to unmute yourself or if you are having challenges with your mic, you can also type any questions or comments in the chat. Also, if you have any ongoing work in this area, if you want to share, um, I think as uh, Brita emphasized, um, it's it's a time to explore new ways of doing things. So um, any sharing of experiences or ongoing initiatives is also. Good day. This is Michelle. I want to thank Victor for that presentation and for making a lot of that material available and reminding us of some of the things that we need to do and what we can do in this setting. Just to share that um, in Jamaica, um, the Essential National Health Research Committee has been activated and they are looking at. Um, Conducting research in a number of different areas. And um, one of those is health systems. And we will be looking at um, some of the changes that have taken place um, since the COVID, comparing what is happening now with the previous time periods. And gender based violence is going to be one of those areas that we'll be assessing to, to see the changes. So we look forward to ongoing work in that area. Being able to document this, just as Rita mentioned. Um, also, we, we are still defining how we will go about um, providing additional support and <clears throat> upgrading and training for the, the healthcare providers. Even though I, I got the sense that um, my colleagues are saying maybe not the healthcare providers are too busy, but also want to look at some of the persons in the um, community-based organizations and some of those who are manning the helplines. And we heard, it hasn't been implemented as yet, but we heard that some of the year five medical students have been assigned, will, will be assigned to, to help to monitor some of the helplines. So they might be a good group to sensitize and have on board to be able to, to possibly identify and redirect and guide persons who might be able to, to um, 
on gender-based violence in this time. Thanks, Michelle, for, for sharing. Um, any other comments or questions, Rita? Any comments from our mental health colleagues, Claudina, Amy? I think Jennifer Hello? has a question. Yes, go ahead, please. Hi. Um, there is the legal aspect of um, child abuse and gender-based violence. And many times it's out of the hands of the mental health workers, especially there's mandatory reporting. And when it's reported to the law, sometimes the case disappears. So how do we... Um, a mental health perspective to prepare the child and the family for the law getting involved in the case. Thanks for that question, Brita. Um, do you want to address it? Yeah, sure. Um, I think I think this is a really good point. I mean, I think in general, um, I think it's it's really important. I think there are two points. One, I think as a as a healthcare provider, we need to be very careful that we are aware of um, where there are reporting requirements. Um, to be able to say this at the very beginning of an interaction uh, with is a survivor of violence. It's very important that we explain the limits of confidentiality, for example, if they exist. If there is mandatory reporting, it's important that we, we don't take that like power away from the survivor. Yes, we have to follow um, local and national laws, but it's important that, that we flag this uh, when we are in conversations with the survivor. Um, second of all, I think it is very important to prepare them for the process. So as much as information, it's, it's important that, that you as a healthcare provider have a basic understanding of how the, 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 the legal process works and what might be required both from you, but also in terms of um, the, the survivor itself and in case of the child, the how it might affect sort of um, the, the broader community they live in. Um, I think, um, and I, I don't think that changes dramatically in the context of COVID. I think what changed in COVID is that we need to think through whether the existing pathways that we have, for example, for reporting or for follow up for um, in the case of child abuse, for removing children from their homes and uh, providing alternatives for care and support uh, in case that exists in a given setting, um, they will have changed in the context of COVID-19. There might be a lack of awareness of the new processes, or it might be not clear what the process is, or there might not be a, a new process been established yet. It's really important that we sort of we're we're part of these discussions that are happening, and uh, um, and on the one hand, have the correct information to be able to provide that to the survivor, uh, but on the other hand, have the opportunity to influence it to make sure their in the case of mental health, their mental health needs are, are met uh, while helping to find practical solutions to the current context. Hope this helps. Thank you. Thanks. I have a question. Is it possible now? Go ahead, Carmen. I was going to give you the floor, but I, I couldn't unmute. Okay. Thank you. It's just, uh, you know, uh, it's a link. It's not directly only about violence, but you know that um, one of the issues that have been uh, discussed and, and, and governments have taken into account is, uh, you know, the, the different measures regarding alcohol uh, prohibition or, or limitations. 
And um, I, I can give you the example of Panama, which I don't know if it's, it's not in the Caribbean region, but, uh, but it's not the only, the only country that I hear the same. Here, it has been directly um, um, restricted alcohol during, uh, I mean, sailing and everything during this time. And the, the main uh, argument given has, the main justification uh, given was uh, related to prevention of violence. I don't know if you could just give us, uh, you know, a couple of tips uh, when we are asked about that to, to you know, to, to be providing uh, real information. Thank you. Yeah, that's a it's a really good question, actually. And I, I know that uh, uh, I've been in discussion. I know the uh, the advisor on alcohol like is working on this, too. Um, and I, I hope there will be more resources coming out soon on this. Um, in the, it is true that um, we've seen some countries um, restricting or banning alcohol sale or um, doing something in that area. Um, and yes, alcohol, the harmful use of alcohol can be a risk factor for violence, though the evidence is a lot more stronger on types of community violence than it is. It's a bit more um, 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 complex <laughs> uh, in the context of intimate partner violence, particularly um, um, or, or a bit more difficult to unpack. So it's 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 specific types of alcohol abuse that have, a, have a, an association with violence. So it's very hard to um, develop, uh, and we're working on this at the moment, to develop key, key messages. I would say that, um, yes, it is, it is a risk factor, and so it, should be, it could be something that could be considered, but we need to look, um, we need to also be aware that we don't know much yet when it comes to family violence specifically particularly intimate partner violence about the effectiveness of these approaches i on the other hand i do think that uh, we are in a time where we are looking particularly for innovative ways um, to to tackle this issue so i i think it is something that uh, that, that, that we can look at sort of context to context and see whether um, then monitor and see whether it has it has the effectiveness in terms of violence that we hope it will have. I know there are some that is specifically to certain types of violence it is of course a much bigger public health argument uh, uh, about the value of these approaches um, that should also be part of of that engagement with government so it's not just but just in the context specifically of certain types of family violence that we see increasing right now and um, it can be considered as one of the options and it's many countries are currently doing this uh, and we're monitoring the situation but the relationship and particularly in terms of the, its effectiveness is not it's, it's very complex i hope i hope this helps so thank you but happy to engage in further discussion on this and then also bring in, um, I think, uh, my colleagues working uh, um, on alcohol control. Thanks. Thanks so much, Brita, um, and thanks, colleagues, for your questions and comments. I think now we're going to move on to the next section in our agenda, um, looking at PAHO regional priorities for mental health and psychosocial support in the context of COVID. And Claudina will walk us through um, a few slides on this. I am going to type my email in the uh, chat. So if you have any follow up questions for Brita, please feel free to reach out to me and I will share with her. So if you have any afterthoughts or, you know, points that you would like to raise with her, please feel free to email me and I will facilitate that discussion. So, Claudina, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, uh, Elisa, and good morning, colleagues. Well, and um, yeah, still good morning. We still have a few more minutes. Uh, the plan is for us to, for me to do a presentation, a very short presentation. And then we want to spend more time in uh, so hearing from you in terms of what uh, it is that uh, has been happening in your country and how best we can support you. Uh, the presentation from Brita was very, very interesting, very enlightening. Thanks very much, Brita. We, so, so, 
We all know that this is, we have this group, which is the Mental Health Car the Caribbean for Men uh, Mental Health Roster. But at the same time, we are also expanding it to make sure that our colleagues who are working at the Ministry of Health can also benefit from these presentations. And what, there, was a, there was a request to have this topic, particularly this topic, the one Brita just presented, gender-based violence, to be one of our topics. So as you notice, when we, after my presentation, we'll go into the, possible, the other topics that we want to. I kind of, I, I did not, I wanted to, you know, um, I think since I'm, have, I'm having the mic now, I thought, you know, one of the issues that we probably, it's good that this is a topic that we are also paying attention to. People are staying together at home, you know, before, uh, you know, each part, the, your partner, your, you know, you go, you go to work, uh, you come from work, the kids are to, uh, go to school. The changes that we're living to now, where we all have to be staying at home and perhaps staying with, you know, kids, uh, children or with adolescents or and then with some extended family members and the stress from work as now you have to be, be work either from your living room or from your one of the bedrooms that too can create a lot of um, in the dynamics at home can create a lot of um, difficult behavior. So violence and challenges will become more, more and more important. I heard yesterday in one of the meetings from the other countries is that the hotlines for domestic violence, the calls are being decreasing. So what they're doing, but they have a hotline for COVID. So what they're doing now is in the hotline from COVID, they're also trying to, when they're listening to people who have experienced a lot of stressful situation, they ask them about you know, if they have any issues with uh, violence at home. So this is just to mention the importance of that topic. I hope that uh, we can spend a little bit more time in understanding uh, how you can uh, support your your communities, especially because, you know, we're doing a lot of work we do now is virtual. Now, my presentation is on the uh, regional priorities for the mental health and psychosocial support. So we all know that MHPSS stands for mental health and psychosocial support, in particular with these challenges that we're facing with COVID. So what, uh, what I will do is to talk to you about this. Um, we have, I'm not, this is a plan that is for um, part of the PAHO as a, as a regional, as a regional organization, PAHO, as you all know from WHO, each we are one of the regions in the Americas. So each one have their, uh, uh, we have our own plan and the idea is to have a plan that can help the country to also develop their own mental health and psychosocial support. So what we what we're expecting is to reduce suffering to improve mental health in the face of COVID. So it has comp the components that we are looking at is First of all, talking about the communication, which is very important in order for us to promote mental well-being. We also talk the another component of this plan is integrating the plan into the uh, into the existing health and social services. So when we talk about mental health and psychosocial support, it's always important to think that this is a cross-cutting issue. This is not just uh, referring to health is also part of social services is also part of education we're also talking about my you know migration we're talking about different social social sectors so of course important to one of the other objectives is to strengthen the community-based interventions and social support a lot of what happens when it, especially in covid we need you know people cannot congregate as they used to before so but they still have to rely maintain a social connection and how that can happen without um uh you know jeopardizing uh close with you know the fact that they can get exposed and they can be uh get infected addressing the needs of a specific populations and here we're uh that's part of that too because the, some populations can be much more vulnerable than others so what we want is it, so of course it's also important to see what lessons learn to ensure that uh, we are collecting data that we're starting to understand what works and what doesn't work when it comes to COVID. So the section on communication. So the idea here is to develop, adapt, and disseminate communication materials 
that um, that are related to COVID. So we have different target populations, you know, for and we in a, in the previous uh, meeting that we had, I presented to you the guidelines that the briefing guides that we received from the IAC. We are familiar with what is IAC, the Interagency Standing Committee, uh, where WHO is also a co-chair, and of, of course they've been having uh, um, regular meetings. And uh, you know, from our, the, from PAHO, the uh, our coordinator, who is Ma Carmen Martinez, and you heard her speaking just now. She is the coordinating the MHPSS for at the regional level. So they also participate at that at that um, stand. Is also part of the ISC committee. So what we're trying to do is to look at some of the materials that they are preparing from WHO and be able to adapt those material and, and look at different target groups. So they have materials for the general population, for health and for um, front health and frontline workers, people at risk of interpersonal violence, for health managers is very important that they are so there is also materials for them for parents and caregivers. People with pre-existing mental and physical conditions, as we all know, this is one of the risk factors for COVID. So there is information for that, for the elderly, for children and adolescents, as well as uh, marginalized and vulnerable populations. And we talk about marginalized and vulnerable population. Here we also could, you know, be much more specific if we wanted to look at persons with disability, people living with HIV and AIDS, uh, refugees, migrants, pregnant women. So, you know, these are very important uh, populations that we also need to have, uh, you know, have think about how do they, how can they be protected in this um, pandemic? Okay. So, the next one. I don't, oh, I'm just, okay. So, the next um, slide. As I mentioned, MHPSS, uh, one of our objectives is also to strengthen, I'm not going to be reading everything because of the time, but just for you to know that our goal is also to support, to strengthen the capacity of the health system so that the health system can be able to effectively, they can deliver um, MHPSS in the face of this pandemic. So how do we do that? We do that by providing a um, strategies. So this is where the uh, we had a we had a webinar to look at um, gui providing guidance for the frontline health workers. You know what are the coping strategies, and then we you know there is guidance for people who are living in isolation or who are in quarantine. How do they protect their mental health? What is that they can do to be able to stay and um, well during this pandemic? So the other section, it also has to do to help, not only for healthcare providers, as I mentioned before, for the health managers, for people who are taking the, who are making decision to provide them guidance in how they can protect people. People are out there doing case, man, um, doing contact tracing. People, uh, and they are get, there's a high anxiety and fear of healthcare provider becoming infected, of coming home and then not, not knowing how to protect themselves. So there's, in, so there's information in terms of how do we um, support them or what, how they support themselves in terms of taking care of their mental well-being so that because when they come home, they can be, uh, they can know what are the steps to protect themselves. So of course, part of the plan is to be able to understand um, here to provide, you know, rapid appraisal. Uh, we want to be able to do monitoring and evaluations uh, because then we want to, this is a new pandemic. We, no one knows really, things are changing as we speak. A lot of things are changing as we speak. So we need to be uh, up to date. We need to be able to uh, learn from other countries what they are doing, how they have learned, how they have coped with that. And then, you know, what works, what doesn't work. So clearly we also part of our regional plan is also to have, um, uh, you know, areas for monitoring and evaluation. So that is very important. And it's also important for us to be able to partner with academia and uh, in doing that. So we can see what, you know, the lesson learns are part of that. 
uh, we want to be able to clearly, this is an area for, you know, the virtual learning. So the, there's guidance for um, uh, adjusting MHPSS intervention to virtual means to start to do e-counseling, e-telemental health, so, you know, supporting people to do virtual, uh, to use the virtual means, digital health is what we will start to be doing. That's a new reality now. Um, only in situation of emergencies that you're allowed to go sometimes to see the physician, but most time is by uh, digital health. And how is that being done? Uh, how do we support what protocols they need to put it in place? So this is another section from the MHPSS. Um, <clears throat> it's also part of, um, this is why we want to be able to provide uh, webinars that will support people in terms of how do you put in place a system that of telehealth. Uh, it's not something most countries know that this is exactly the way to go, but sometimes they don't have the framework or the tools to be able to do that. So that's part of that. Uh, the last part, which has to do with uh, um, for uh, specifically for PAHO in terms of the um, because, yeah, so, you know, we are all humans and this could be, when you think of that, it can also be applicable to, um, to each one of you working at the Ministry of Health in terms of providing support to the staff to, to make sure that there is, in, there is um, information how people can take care of themselves. We are providing services and so we need to make sure that there is appropriate messages on, you know, sharing videos or PowerPoint about coping with stress, about psychosocial aspects, and then uh, supporting each other during this outbreak. This, um, this is just to give you an idea of that plan. We will provide you, um, I think at the end, uh, I know that we'll be sent, giving you copies of the presentation. We'll adjust it so that, uh, not immediately, but then I know that uh, with Dr. Prieto, one of the things that we want to do is to make sure that whatever we present, we share with you, uh, uh, but not just sharing the information. For me, it's also important that you use this to, as a guidance to work with the, in your countries. And so the idea is to make it a two-way street. How do you adjust that to your, to your, your context? Not everything will be the same. Each one, each one of the islands, each, each one of the countries have their specific dynamics. And so we want to make sure that even the videos that we're developing, even the material that that could be adjusted to your own setting. So I want to stop here. Uh, it's already because as I, you know, as I say, this was a very short presentation just to give you an, an information of, of what is what we are working on. Uh, that there is a regional plan for MHPSS. WHO also has a, a plan of uh, MHPSS, and we try to align ourselves to that. And the same thing, we are expecting the countries to align themselves to an MHPSS uh, plan. So I stop here, um, Elisa, and then of course this presentation, um, my colleague, as I, I mentioned, uh, Carmen and, and Amy also, I think she's also in the call, the, uh, working we are all uh, we have another colleague andrea bruni who is working for the uh, south american countries and uh, carmen is working with the central american countries and i am working with caribbean countries but we get together very often to look at what is available to be able to support the uh, the region when it comes to uh, mental health and psychosocial support um thanks for your attention so i'll stop my uh the screen uh, um, pass the mic to to my colleague, Dr. Prieto. Go ahead. Thanks, Claudina. Thanks for that presentation. And um, mm. I would like to open the floor to colleagues to uh, make comments or ask questions. Uh, please feel free to take the mic or type in the chat. Good afternoon. Please go ahead. Yes, good. You, you going, Karen, or? Um, it's all right. I'll wait until you're finished. <laughs> and good afternoon, Patrice here. Thank you, Claudina, for a very concise and applicable presentation. Um, you mentioned the guidance tool for the implementation of Tele-MHPSS, and I just wanted to put in a plug here 
for support from um, your office in this area? Would you be able to assist us with that? Is there a tool available and would you be able to assist? Can we have a separate conversation perhaps? Sure, I think that's part of the thank you, Patrice, and thanks for participating. Uh, and I think this is uh, important for, for us to have this kind of discussions, how we can be supporting our countries, given that uh, this is the era of digital health. So there is a WHO document. Um, and we also want to be working through with our colleague, as you know, Amalia Del Riego from HSS. So the idea would be supporting countries to put in place uh, digital health. And there is uh, from the ISC guidelines, they're also working on developing um, guides for countries to put together what we call tele MHPSS. One of the things that we are very careful with is that when we, you know, countries, like I've seen there's so many things happening now, but we want to make sure that we do no harm. We want to make sure that everything we're doing, especially when it comes from PAHO, is evidence-based, uh, there is consultation behind it, that we're sending it to the country because we know this can work. So thanks for asking. It will be a pleasure for us to engage in that discussion to support uh, uh, EC Barbados and the ECC countries, definitely. Um, it will require, as you know, it will require discussions in terms of the uh, characteristics of each country and resources that are available and how will that be done, but definitely we, we want to be able to uh, part, be engaged in that discussion. Thanks, Patrice. Uh, we'll, I'll put an, I make a note that we'll converse and we'll talk about that. Karen, please go ahead. Um, thank you, Elisa, and thanks, Claudina, for the presentation. I know that in Guyana, we have been in um, discussions with you regarding the specific aspects of mental health and psychosocial support um, that the country will require. But I just wanted to raise this issue for the benefit of other colleagues who might be encountering the same challenge. In Guyana, within the last two weeks, um, a serious situation has emerged where there is a lot of discrimination and stigmatizing against healthcare providers to the extent that they are being rejected from public forms of transportation for the ones who need to catch public transportation. Um, what the country has done um, in the interim, like an interim intervention, is to try to see to what extent they can provide special transportation for healthcare providers. Some healthcare providers have um, come up with creative ways of getting to and from work in the sense that they're not dressing um, to look obviously like a nurse or a doctor. And in that way, um, they've been able to access public transportation. But that, is, that has emerged as one of the challenges for healthcare providers. I know that we are working with Dr. Caetano to come up with some virtual virtual sessions for healthcare providers in terms of psychosocial support. And in one of the slides that she shared, it was good to observe that there are plans to address issues of um, stigma and discrimination. I just wanted to highlight that for us, that would be an important um, element to add. Regarding the health education campaign for the COVID, we have not been able to address aspects of stigma and discrimination, but we flagged it as an area that we will try to see how we could add to the general um, education and awareness campaign so that we could start, use that as an initial place to start in terms of addressing the new forms of discrimination that we're observing against healthcare providers. Hello. Great, thanks, Karen. That that's a really great uh, comment, and I'm sure it's something that is happening in other countries. I think we have someone else who wants to comment. Please take the mic. Yes, I have a question. It's Jennifer Joseph Montserrat. Um, what we see emerging is um, the whole area of grieving death and the fact that people cannot attend the funerals 
etc. I'm not sure if there's anything we are planning to put in place as an alternative as mental health workers, alternatives for, for, the, for grieving for family members who have lost loved ones and are unable to join in the, the normal um, funerals and wakes, etc. Claudina, do you want to address this question? Yes, of course. Um, well, first of all, when I listen to, so I, I want to address the questions one from Karen. Thanks a lot, Karen. Normally, when we think about stigma and discrimination, we think about stigma of people who have mental health problems. But look, now people are people who are COVID positive are also having depending on which stage they are, there's a lot of discrimination. It is so sad to hear that a healthcare provider who is working in saving life, who, who is putting herself or himself at risk, and it may be the only breadwinner in their family because may have a partner who, because of the, you know, the, if they're working in tourism, if they're working in, in the, you know, in the restaurant, whatever those things are closed, so they are the only breadwinner, and yet they're being discriminated, and they're going to do a job to save others' life. But this is the reality. That's exactly what is happening, because of, you know, this is the pandemic. People are scared, and they they are they themselves are so scared when they come home that they can infect their kids, they can infect their family. So I think it's important for us to pay attention to not only how do we support them, what we need to do, and I'm and I'm it's, you know I, I know we can we're working on the um you know on this developing this um uh, this webinar for front for health workers. So Karen, thank you for bringing it because I think we're starting to see that happening and it's not something we're expecting, but we know that that will happen. In terms of the, um, the socialization, that is true. Uh, thanks, uh, Jennifer, for bringing that to, uh, to our attention because what tends to happen with the social, the, the physical distancing measures that they are being putting in place, uh, we need to start to target, uh, think of people in grief uh, isolations or with loss that they have not only they have lost uh, loved ones and people who also lost their livelihood. So part of the I did not um, because I, I didn't want to go through all the specificity of the MHPSS. But part of the MHPSS is there's a section on you know the, when you think of the pyramid, the strength of community-based intervention and social support. So that has to do with uh, addressing the pre-existing and emerging communities, uh, emerging community support, you know. So how do we target uh, people who have lost, uh, because we, we cannot, and I think I mentioned that in one of my conversations the last time that we can, the grief is not the same like before, you know, people are dying, but you cannot congregate, you can't go to church, you can't go to, you know, you don't do that like before. Uh, and, and so now you have to find ways of supporting each other. So there is a section on, um, you know, how do we support people who are in grief, who are in isolation, who are who have lost, not only lost as I say, loved one, but who also have lost their own livelihoods because they are going through changes, through anxiety, through grief. So that is part of this uh, MHPSS. Maybe as um, it is one of the goals is to be able to enhance people' uh, mental well-being. But it is included there, uh, Jennifer, for sure. Thanks for ask, ask, uh, asking the question. Uh, I think this physical distancing we need to be able to, this is why we need to think of the tele or social media peer support groups. Uh, and you see in that with the uh, faith based uh, organizations, you know, where they're now having this side, this support psychosocial support groups. Uh, I think that's very important to put them in place. Good. Thank you. Hi, good morning. This is Tara. Can you hear me? Go ahead, Tara. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Thank you, Claudina, for your presentation. I also wanted to follow on, on Karen's comment about stigma and discrimination. Um, in Trinidad, we're, we're also having an issue 
as it relates to Trinidad and Tobago, as it relates to stigma and discrimination, and especially ag among um, against the families, persons and families who have um, a suspected or confirmed case of COVID. So I think it was last week, there was a situation um, where you have persons who are in quarantine, um, they have tested positive, they're in government facility um, being quarantined, but they were being quarantined in a hospital setting. So because these persons are not exhibiting any, any, any um, signs or symptoms, but they were waiting for their, their final negative tests, because um, you know, to be released from quarantine or, or isolation, they need to have two negative um, results after their sy symptoms have subsided. So these yeah. persons symptoms have already subsided. Um, they're waiting for their two negative, negative um, results but the government want to move them out of the hospital setting and bring them in a more um, community kind um, quarantine facility. And the community in which that facility is situated um, was protesting because they, they, they saw these persons as coming in to contaminate their community. So we really will have a problem as it relates to reintegration of persons into their communities, um, even after being released from these facilities as being free from the virus. So we also have to look at interventions and strategies to prepare the community um, to really um, embrace these families and to remove the stigma and discrimination. As you said, um, Claudina, it's very, looking at stigma and discrimination now, it's really different from what we're used to with other, with other conditions, with other diseases. So we really have to look at the best strategies that we can implement to, to get families to be reintegrated into their community after being released from hospitals and quarantine facility. And at the same time, persons who are quarantined at home um, because they have in signs and symptoms, how do we um, get the community to embrace these persons and remove that stigma and discrimination? Thank you. Over. Cara, we really appreciate your insight uh, and, and uh, into this. As you know, there is a um, on stigma and discrimination, but I think the stigma and th that again we need to think of our own context. Uh, it's so sad to see what people, you know, like they they people who have this disease they're suffering because the fear of being infected and then if you're positive and you know there's complication, you can lose your life and to be uh, to be discriminated. Like I mean, you know, this is this is a really double pain or triple, I'm not so sure what's the word I want to use for that. So I think there must be a way for us to, to create that kind of sensitization, to create the talking. How do we support people when they're going through this kind of uh, situation? So thanks for bringing it up. We have, we do have, as you notice there, we have uh, proposed topics for future webinars. And I think we probably should ask uh, <laughs> Lisa probably to add the issue of stigma and discrimination. Um, because it's not just for the, it's for healthcare providers, people who have been positive to COVID, probably we should add that. And I think each one of us who are in this webinar have a role to play in, um, in, in be able to send the word and supporting people with, who have been discriminated against. So we probably should add that to our list. Okay. Um, we had thought that we should give you an opportunity to also hear from you. So we have 15 minutes more before, Elisa, am I correct? So we can hear yes. from some of the countries how they're doing. I, I have been very, uh, because I work with some of you, so I got a video from Deepna. Um, Deepna is a psychiatrist, she's a psychiatric nurse who works in the Cayman. She shared a beautiful video, uh, Deepna probably we can share with the colleagues at some point on how they are developing, uh, uh, it's a YouTube resources, it's a um, helpline 
for people who want some kind of information and want to contact that. So I know uh, Wendy, you also are doing, Wendy Fernander and Dr. Wendy, they are also doing some work in the Bahamas. But let's hear from you, what are the work that you're doing and uh, how best we can support you um, in, in the work, in the work with the uh, fight against COVID. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, colleagues, for these last few minutes, while um, you gather your thoughts, I just wanted to share some of the proposed topics um, for future sessions. We had agreed um, in, uh, on our last webinar to hold this type of exchange every two weeks. And um, there are some topics on that slide. Uh, what I would like to propose is, as follow-up to this meeting, I will reshare um, a very brief questionnaire, it's just a couple of questions um, to give you an opportunity to rate the topics that are uh, proposed on the slide and propose additional topics. So we can really tailor these sessions to the areas where you feel you would like to focus the most. So I will reshare together with the recording and the presentations the link, and it won't take you more than two minutes, just um, a very easy questionnaire with two questions to rate the list that you have on the screen and then an additional open question so you can provide any additional topic that you feel would be helpful to guide your work. So um, I don't know if anyone wants to, to share, um, as Claudina was proposing, any of the work that you're doing at country level on MHPSS and COVID-19. I think it's very helpful for colleagues to know what is being done, um, how can we learn from each other, how can we maybe um, take advantage of resources that are being developed in some of the countries. Um, so if you have any work that you would like to share, please feel free to just take the mic. Hi, good day. This is Ashvini Nas from Trinidad and Tobago. So I just wanted to share on what we are doing in Trinidad and Tobago. We, are coordinated, we have coordinated the mental health psychosocial response very much aligned to PAHO's recommendations. Um, we have explored and executed a tele-mental health service, and this is being run by the mental health professionals at our regional health authorities. And it's to support both the frontline workers and persons in quarantine. So each RHA, they have actually set up separate services so that they can su support persons in quarantine and there's also uh, hotlines that are available for, person, for frontline workers, their staff, to call into if needed. We've also developed some public education messages, um, very much like PAHO suggested, targeted to different target groups, including the general public, employers, children, persons in quarantine, et cetera. We, um, we've had some NGOs, like our professional associations, the Trinidad and Tobago Association of Psychologists, and the Social Workers Association who have developed their own hotlines to provide support to the public during this time, noting that there's heightened anxiety and mental health, mental distress. So we have been encouraging and circulating um, information about their hotlines as well and encouraging people to seek support through these mediums. Uh, the issue of stigma, as Tara mentioned, is, is definitely one that we are struggling with right now. And it was addressed yesterday by our director of mental health at the daily um, press conference, and she was able to give some helpful tips based on the messaging that um, we received from PAHO on how to address stigma during this pandemic. Um, going, I, I know I missed part of the first presentation, but just going back, our commission of police during this morning's press, press briefing, he noted that there was an increase in the number of domestic violence cases um, from the previous calendar year. So this is something that's being addressed through an interministerial committee in Trinidad as well. 
um, our mental health clinics, they remain operational, but they're not running as usual. I mean, they're really seeing the most urgent cases or people just picking up prescriptions and so forth. I think um, in terms of support, what we may need the most is uh, a technical assistance to do a rapid assessment, particularly if we anticipate that there's going to be an increase in the cases over the next few weeks and we have limited mental health resources. So I think support in that area might be particularly useful for us. Um, thank you. Um, if I may add, um, I'm Wendy from Suriname, and I look forward to uh, possible the presentation talking about um, different ways that we can um, well, in different, well, the different ways we can implement certain activities, because of course we know there is stigma and discrimination, but I think the same way which we had it um, during HIV, I mean, you can talk about it, but talking about it doesn't change much because um, our attitude, our feelings, people are, are afraid. So I think it's, it's good to look at ways or things that we can do to the it. So I just have an example. I mean, it's already gone, but we had, of course, we all had the um, World um, uh, Health Day. And on that day, the healthcare workers, they were really um, commented for the work and the, min the, the power of the ministry together with the power. We really try to kind of um, have them um gather attention and kind of highlight their work so the community also based on the comments made you realize that people kind of um show their appreciation so on the one hand uh, we might maybe know that the community might look a uh, certain way kind of being afraid to be around them we have to be sure in the type of things that we say or the things we do um, of course, if there is a lack of protective equipment, you might hear it in the, the news, but the way we present it, the way things are being said, we might create that fear on the, um, you know, if people might be worried about the protection. So we have to ensure that certain things that are not really needed to share, uh, we don't share. That is one. And the second one is, um, uh, what was it? I forgot. But anyway, so that was my point I wanted to make, just to be sure that the way we, um, oh yeah, this is what I wanted to say. Um, we also have this daily press conference. Well, no, it's not daily. Again, it's, um, um, it, um, it's th three times a week. But as soon as, for example, COVID um, patients are um, um, returned or when if they return home and they are um, quote unquote better, <laughs> doing much better, the media, the, the, the government kind of shares that information with the media and the way that is uh, um, being shared with the media is, hey, we are very happy because of one more case that we can say, hey, um, has, you know, is, is feeling better, is improving, will is able to go home. So maybe it's also a way to kind of quote unquote celebrate with those that are doing much better and are free of the virus. So um, people that can kind of might be um, something that we can use to kind of um, decrease the fear that people might have. So just sharing that, thank you. Great, thanks. So it's already 12.30. So if um, um, there are no other um, colleagues who want to share, maybe we can start wrapping up. Um, I would like to thank you for joining, for your participation. Um, I would like to again uh, remind you to go in the form that I will share to just um, really very quick indicate what are the areas that you think are most relevant. So we can really tailor this webinar series to your needs. Um, and um, before I close, I would just like to give the floor to Carmen and to Laurina to, to say any uh, final words or share any final thoughts.
Lynn, you want to go ahead? Okay, well, just uh, thank you very much for the participation. I think that this is going it's going to, to be, it, it is going, it is uh, being an effort uh, on together. And I think that, uh, that um, we are really here to be supporting. So please, I know that uh, Elisa and Claudina are very close to you and, and uh, it's important that we are really trying to provide whatever support is required by the country. So thank you and uh, and uh, keeping that thank you thanks thanks a lot carmen uh, i mentioned carmen is supporting this this process this effort so it's very i'm glad that you're able to join us um someone was asking where carmen is working well carmen you know everybody's virtual but her office is in, in panama at the moment and uh, we also had with us betsy butron betsy is a physician she's also she also worked with Pajo. I think she probably joined us a bit late. Um, and I know she's the she's the child, she's an advisor, children. Uh, advisor, I know I saw you somewhere there, um, um, um Betsy. So uh thanks for joining for all the colleagues who are who are here. I know we don't have a lot of time for uh, for you to give us your feedback, but I'm really glad to see uh to hear from Ashvini from Trinidad. That's very good to know the things that you're doing. Um, thanks, Wendy, for your participation too about you know what's happening in Suriname. I I, I took note that we need to we need to be able to celebrate the things that you're doing. We need to um, uh, you know the way how we present this information also has should be able to change how people view view uh, persons who have been uh, diagnosed to be positive with COVID. But it's as you know how we present the information. Uh, thanks. I see Dr. Rubin from uh, BVI. I'm glad that you were able to join us. Uh, I think you know the idea is to get together, discuss our challenges, and find ways, listen from each other, and find ways to um, make a difference. I was glad to hear there's so many colleagues from the Bahamas. So uh, you know, I'm, I'm glad to know that we can be uh, having these meetings. The plan is to do it on a, at least we had say every two weeks. So uh, around the same time, uh, so mark your calendar. And if we need to do it more often, um, I'm, uh, we also with uh, my colleague Elisa, we pro we can discuss that and see if this is necessary. Thanks again, Elisa. I appreciate uh, working with you as per usual. And thanks, Brita. Good presentation. Bye bye. Thanks, thanks, um, Brita, um, uh, again for your excellent presentation. I know part, um, as many of you know, I'm originally from Spain, which is one of the countries that is being um, hardest hit right now. And um, one of the things that I feel is really helping everybody is the celebration of healthcare workers. So every day at 8 p.m., the whole country stands outside the windows and claps um, as a celebration of the effort that healthcare providers are doing. And I think that's a way of, of you know, um, feeling proud of of all those frontline workers who are really putting everything into um, saving lives and providing care. And it's really um, an excellent way of reminding everybody every day of that work. And I think it really helps counter or compensate some of the stigma or some of the you know, fear that may be felt. So just wanted to share that thought before closing. I will be following up with um, an email as usual, including the link, the presentations, and uh, we will be sending out an invite for the next session. Thanks everybody for joining. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.